Welcome to the pattern matching and case expressions lesson. Today we'll cover pattern matching in function definitions with catch all patterns. Then we'll take a closer look at the internal structure of lists. Then we'll learn about pattern matching list tuples and case expressions. And finally, we will discuss the differences between the declaration style of programming and the expression style of programming. Let's start with pattern matching. Pattern matching is the act of matching data, values, types, etc., against a pattern, optionally binding variables to successful matches. We're going to discuss pattern matching in three different scenarios, function definitions, list, and tuples. It sounds complicated, but actually it's pretty intuitive when you get the hang of it. It will be clear as day after a few examples. Let's pattern match some functions. Remember the special birthday function from last lesson? It's a function that takes an integer and returns a string, and according to the value of the integer, does different things. I know, I know, we fixed that atrocity with cards, but we will get fancier and solve it with pattern matching. To pattern match on function definitions, we just have to define the same function multiple times, replacing the parameters with the values that we will want. Like this. Here, we define three different functions. And according to the value of the parameter, we get three different results. And how does it work? Well, when presented with a code like this, Haskell will attempt to match the value of h with the first definition. And if h is not one, it will try to match the second definition. If it's not 18, it will try to match third definition and so on and so forth until the value passed as parameter matches one of the definitions value. And of course, I'm sure you know this a huge problem. What happens if we pass a number different from the ones defined before, like 29, for example? In the previous definition, we had the else clause. Now we have catch all patterns. Catch all patterns allow you to provide a default definition in case none of your specific ones match. To use catch all patterns, you have to provide a name that starts with lowercase, like age, x, or year since this poor soul has touched the earth. Like this. Here we have the final definition where we provide the age as a catch all pattern. If we pass an integer that is not any of these ones, it will just fall down in this definition. It's important to notice that you always have to provide pattern matches for all possible scenarios. For example, if you're pattern matching for booleans, you have to pattern match for both true and false. Or for example, you could pattern match for just empty lists and list with something. But if you don't provide all the patterns, you always have to use a catch all pattern at the end. Another important detail is that Haskell matches from top to bottom. So if you do something like this, where the catch all pattern is the first one, the first definition will catch all the occurrences and will always get nothing special as a result, no matter the number that we pass. So make sure to add the catch all pattern as the last definition. Finally, we said that we can optionally bind variables to successful matches. And that's what we just did. When using special birthday, every time the value falls into the age catch-all pattern, we bind that value to the age variable, allowing us to use the value inside the definition expression here. You cannot overstate how useful this is. You're filtering values to the ones that matches a specific pattern, and you're binding those values to variables for related use at the same time. A more compelling example of how this is useful is when pattern matching more complex structures like lists and tuples. Let's explore that. Before learning about pattern matching with lists, we need to take a closer look at lists. 
We know that the cons operator adds an element to the beginning of a list. It prepends an element. Remember when I told you that string was syntactic sugar for a list of characters? Well, get ready for a sugar rush because the way we wrote the list so far is actually syntactic sugar for the real way Haskell sees lists. As an empty list prepend with all the elements that it contains. Like this. Now, you could be thinking, why do I care? I will keep writing the list as always. To what I said, aha, uh -huh, pattern matching. Now that we know how lists look like without the makeup, we can use it to pattern match different function definitions depending on the list structure. Let's pattern match a bunch of different ways and investigate how the code works later. So we have the what's inside this list function that takes a list of integers and returns a string. And as you can see, you can pattern match for an empty list or lists of fixed size, both with syntactic sugar like this and without syntactic sugar like this. And also you can pattern match for non-empty lists of any size with the catch-all pattern here. In this case, the rest variable will contain the entire list except for the first element. Also notice that we surround with parentheses the last two definitions to indicate here and here that the function takes everything inside the parentheses as a single argument. And because we bound the matches to variables, x, y, z, and rest, you can use those variables inside the function definition, like here, here, and here. But what if you don't need them? What if you want to do something when a specific pattern matches, but you don't really care about the actual values? Binding values and then ignoring them pollutes your environment with variables you never use. But don't worry, to put the cherry on top, you can ignore the data you don't care for while pattern matching for the rest. Take a look at the following function. It tells us which are the first and third elements in a list of booleans. We have first and third that takes a list of booleans and returns a string. Then we have two definitions. The first one pattern matches for a list that has at least three elements because we are using the first and the third. We are ignoring the second and then we're ignoring the rest. The rest in this case can be a bunch of elements or it can be just the empty list. And if this pattern doesn't match, we don't really care about the pattern. So we just ignore it entirely. Awesome, right? Knowing this, we can modify the initials function of the last lesson. Remember, the initial function took two strings and returned a string. The first string was the name of a person and the second was the last name. Then we checked if the lists were empty. And if they weren't, we extracted the first letter of the name and the first letter of the last name and then concatenated them. Perfect. All good so far. But knowing what we know now, we can do something like this. Same function takes two strings and returns a string, but now we can pattern match the lists, the first and the second list, to make sure that they have at least one element each. And then, because we already bound the elements, we can actually use them to create the result. Any other pattern, we just don't care. It's shorter and clearer. Now let's see how pattern matching makes our lives easier with tuples. As you recall from previous lessons, we could only get the elements inside a pair, a tuple of two elements, using the FST and SND functions, first and second. If you need a value from a tuple bigger than that, you were in a pickle. But now that you're a pattern matching magician, the sky is the limit. Want to extract the first element of a three element tuple? 
no problem. Just define the function, pattern match for the first element and ignore the rest. Want to create a pair with the second and fourth elements of a four element tuple? No problem, same as before, pattern match for the second and the fourth and ignore the rest. Just returns the one that you need. And you can keep going if you want. But right now we're going to move to case expressions. With case expressions, we can execute a specific block of code based on a variable's pattern. Same as with switch statements in other programming languages, case expressions looks like this, where the value exp expression is compared to every pattern inside the block. And if it matches, the corresponding result is evaluated. Notice that there's no equal sign. That's because the entire case expression is just an expression, not a function, nor a binding. As an example, we can write a function that takes a three in tuple and checks if any of the elements that it contains is zero. Like this. We create the function checks for zeros that takes a tuple of three elements and returns a string. We pass the tuple and then say, okay, in the case that the tuple is of a structure zero and I don't care the other two, we return the first one is a zero. Then we check if the second one is a zero and we ignore the other two and they say, okay, the second one is a zero and so on and so forth until we check all three of them. And then we don't really care the structure. We don't really care about the values either. We just return, okay, we're good. There's no zeros there. And I already can hear you saying, isn't the end result the same that we go when pattern matching on parameters in function definitions? Well, yes. At its core, pattern matching on parameters in function definitions is just syntactic sugar for the case expressions. So this code is interchangeable with this one. But because now we are using case expressions, we can use them anywhere an expression can be used, not only when defining a function. For example, we can concatenate the result of evaluating the case expression with another string like this. In this case, the signature is the same, but we concatenate first this string plus the string version of the value plus another string, and then we concatenate the result of evaluating this case expression. That makes case expressions convenient to use, to use inside other expressions. But also keep in mind that anything that you can do with case expressions can be done by defining functions with let, where, or got. And that begs the question, why do we have so many ways of doing the same thing? I will tell you why. There are two main styles for writing functional programming in Haskell. We have the declaration style where you formulate an algorithm in terms of several equations to be satisfied and the expression style where you compose big expressions from small expressions. Many moons ago, the Haskell gods engaged in a furious debate as to which style was better, mainly because if there was possible, having just one way of doing something provided less confusion and redundancy. But after blood, sweat, and tears were shed, they decided to provide full syntactic supports to both and let the mere mortals use what they like best. As examples, we got the word clause versus let expressions, pattern matching in function definitions versus explicitly doing the case expressions. We have guards where we define different equations versus the expressive if, then, else. And finally, we have functions arguments on the less side, like your mathematical equations and lambda abstractions. And what's that lambda thing at the end of the table? That's a subject for the next week's lesson. So make sure to watch it. Now, as a summary, pattern matching for function definitions makes it straightforward to do different things depending on the structure or value of the arguments. 
Pattern matching on tuples, lists, and other resources allows you to easily extract the values contained. Case expressions are a more expressive way of pattern matching function definitions, but they can also be used almost everywhere as any other expression. And finally, the two main styles for writing functional programming in Haskell are the declaration style and the expression style. Don't waste time arguing about which one is the best. Adopt the one you like more or mix and match as you want. That's it for today. Make sure to do the homework and I see you in the next one.